I want to take you back to March 2020. The coronavirus had landed in the United States. Social distancing had entered our vocabulary. Schools were closed, college students were home much earlier than anticipated, myself included, and store shelves were empty. It was against this backdrop that Europe grappled with its first wave of the coronavirus. One of the key shortages they faced? Ventilators. A ventilator is a life-saving medical device used to support a patient's breathing when they're having difficulty breathing on their own. So obviously, it's particularly useful in the case of a respiratory infection like the coronavirus. And sure enough, as the United States gained steam in its first wave, ventilators emerged as one of the key shortages. In fact, right here in Oregon, the Oregon Health Authority, which is a state regulatory agency, projected a shortage of hundreds of ventilators for critically ill COVID-19 patients. It was against this backdrop that the OHA reached out for help to a number of individuals and companies, among them Intel. And while Intel itself decided not to take on the responsibility of designing and manufacturing a ventilator, the request filtered its way down to senior staff at the company, one of whom happened to have been a manager of mine at a former internship. It was through his efforts in cobbling together a team that LifeMech, a nonprofit collective of engineers, doctors, and other innovators designed to address the ventilator shortfall, was born. Now, when we, LifeMech came together with the prospect of designing a ventilator, we had several key principles in mind. One is that obviously we were operating in a crisis environment, and that meant there was no time to waste. The ventilator shortage was projected to be imminent in Oregon and in the United States more broadly, and was already ongoing in Europe and other parts of the world. Therefore, rapid development and deployment of our technology was essential. Moreover, the odds were that our technology could be deployed in a relatively non-traditional medical setting which meant, for example, there may not be access to reliable medical-grade electricity, so battery backup could be useful. Moreover, because of the global scale of the coronavirus catastrophe, our design being scalable both in its design and its manufacturing was absolutely essential. So that means that it, was relatively, it had to be relatively easy to manufacture with, with uh, parts that could be procured from global supply chains that weren't too uh, rigid or easily stressed by this unprecedented circumstance. Moreover, it had to be low cost and open source in order to be easily deployable in communities worldwide. So the idea behind open source is that a, a doctor or another nonprofit organization or something like that in a different country could just download our designs and our code off of the internet and easily manufacture the ventilator with parts available in their own country. And finally, and the doctors on LifeMech felt especially strongly about this, our ventilator needed to be medical grade. Thankfully, there were a lot of folks taking on the problem of designing a low-cost ventilator, but not everyone was considering whether or not doctors would actually feel comfortable using this in patients. And so in everything we did, we wanted to make sure we were designing things with sufficient rigor, with sufficient precision, with sufficient testing, that a doctor would feel comfortable using our product on a critically ill COVID-19 patient. Now, this is our team. We had employees from all of these companies who volunteered their time to the LifeMech initiative. And I want to emphasize that this was a volunteer, not-for-profit project, and none of the companies pictured here, although their employees did volunteer their time, were officially sponsors of the project. So as you can see, we have folks from more traditional engineering companies like Intel, Apple, Boeing, but also legal support and doctors from OHSU and Kaiser Permanente, as well as a host of other contributors who really uh, made a key impact on different aspects of LifeMech's design as a product, but also its success as a nonprofit. Now, I want to introduce you to sort of an early prototype of what the LifeMech adaptive ventilation system looked like. So as you can see, there's this gray box on the table. That's the LifeMech ventilator. You can see that black panel. That's a touch screen that physicians can use to read out data from the product and to also input settings. Lastly, there's a bag. It looks kind of like a balloon, but it's actually an Ambu bag that's designed to push air into the patient. So it's in these mechanical claws, and those close, squeezing air out through the tube and into the patient's lungs, which supports their breathing. Now, in this case, uh, playing the part of lungs is this artificial ventilator testing device that um, we used in order to make sure our ventilator was working properly. Here's a closer look at what the user interface looks like. As you can see, we have uh, several graphs here that show important measurements that the doctor needs to be monitoring to ensure the patient is breathing properly. But there are also several inputs that the doctor can set in order to determine how the ventilator is operating. So for example, they can control the respiratory rate, which is how many breaths the ventilator is delivering per minute. They can also control the tidal volume, which is essentially how deep those breaths are. What is the volume of oxygen that the ventilator needs to push into the patient? And those things need to be very precisely controlled. 
which uh, posed another significant engineering challenge in making sure our system was doing exactly what the doctor intended it to do. Um, another key aspect is that we were working entirely in a remote environment with tremendous uncertainty. Um, as I mentioned, this was early 2020, so this was about March to July 2020. And so while you know, virtual conferencing and video solutions are very familiar to all of us now, I mean, that's how we're communicating right now, Zoom, Teams, Skype, all of that was relatively new to our team then. And that posed a host of challenges with making sure everyone was on the same page. Moreover, for those of us on the software side, my main contribution was designing the ventilator UI. It made it harder to determine whether our software was doing what we thought it was doing, since we didn't actually have access to the physical ventilator sitting by our side. That meant we had to get creative with figuring out ways to remotely work with each other and with the machine in order to ensure that our code and our system designs were performing as expected. There were also other challenges independent of the remote environment. For one, as I alluded to earlier, this was an entirely volunteer initiative during a highly uncertain time. That meant that folks were trying to adapt to their day job suddenly being remote, their kids in remote school, while also giving as much time as they could to this critically important volunteer project. Because of that, you know, folks were phasing in and out of the project, their involvement was ebbing and flowing, and that made cross-team communication especially critical, because it wasn't always the same folks who were contributing to each part of the project. So this is one of my first times actually getting to interact with the ventilator itself. This is in one of our LifeMech hardware development HQs, also known as someone's garage who was on the team. Uh, you can see the ventilator on the table in front of us. And, uh, we, but later on, we actually got to test it in a more uh, sophisticated environment at the simulation lab at OHSU. And that was very interesting for me as a UI designer because I actually got to see how a ventilator tech who's trained to do this for a living interacted with my design and with our system and to make sure that everything was intuitive and understandable and was doing exactly what they expected it to do. It was also very gratifying for us on a personal level to see our ventilator pumping air and the dummy's chest rising and falling, just as a real patient would in a hospital bed. That being said, there were some pitfalls along the way. So this is a clip from my Snapchat where you can see I accidentally made the ventilator uh, flash yellow, which is not what you want from a ventilator. But we were able to get that fixed, but there was another problem later on where, um, uh, where I told the ventilator to start doing testing and it just uh, decided not to. Not really sure why that happened, but we were able to get that ironed out. And um, eventually we were actually able to get FDA approval for this project, and that's a huge deal. The FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration, regulates all medical devices and therapies in the United States. And because of that, uh, getting FDA approval for a project really confers on it a degree of legitimacy and shows that you've seriously considered the testing. It also allows it to be deployed in the United States and more broadly in international communities where the FDA's ruling is regarded as paramount. And this is a real testament to the hard work of everyone on the LifeMech team, as well as the unprecedented pace under which the FDA was able to operate due to the um, COVID-19 pandemic and the emergency situation it caused. But although the ventilator shortage is behind us for now in the US, thankfully, the situation for COVID remains dire in many parts of the world. For those of you who may not be familiar, it is traditional in the Hindu faith to cremate the dead. Every single pile of logs or pyre that you see in this photo is a funeral pyre. It's a dead patient. And one of the key causes of so many deaths is a, is a severe lack of ventilators in many hospitals in India. For example, just this past week, a doctor who had worked at a hospital for 50 years died of coronavirus because he was unable to find a ventilator. This just highlights the need for more affordable, low-cost ventilation solutions like LifeMex, and broadly more innovations in response to the ongoing COVID pandemic. So to end this out, I wanted to share with you uh, three takeaways I had from my experience working on LifeMex. One is that crises create a need for innovation. There's an old saying that necessity was, is the mother of all invention, and that's really true in this case. Another important point is it's more vital than ever that we understand how to innovate under crisis conditions, because in a world affected by climate and technological change, the pace of crises is, I believe, increasing. For example, just uh, recently, Vice President Harris warned that the US should already start preparing for the next pandemic. So understanding how we can develop effective technological solutions under these conditions is more critical than ever. The second is that the future of innovation is interdisciplinary. As you can see from the LifeMech team, we had folks from a variety of different backgrounds, from traditional engineering to medicine to law to design. And as our problems become more complex and multifaceted in an interconnected world, 
having folks from different backgrounds come together to address these problems is going to be even more vital in the future. And finally, one thing I learned from my experience with LifeMech is that you're never too young to make an impact. I hadn't even finished my freshman year of college when I started working on this project. And even though most of the other folks on the team were senior engineers with decades of experience, I felt like I was still able to make an effective contribution through throwing myself completely into the work. One of the best ways to learn is by doing, and that was definitely true in my case. I learned so many new skills, abilities, and habits through collaborating with these senior engineers to build this product. So this is what we built. This is the LifeMech Adaptive Ventilation System FDA-approved low-cost open source ventilator. I'm so honored to have been able to contribute to this project and to share it with the world, and I'm beyond excited to see where it's used in the future. Thank you.